That's recording, is it? Yes, it is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's uh, thank you very much for um, coming to the um, physical activity webinar series. This is the first one on our, our series. Um, my name is Dr. James Burgess from Sports and Exercise Medicine Registrar in Birmingham and GP. Um, uh, we're going to talk today about um, various things to introduce the webinar series. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Justin Varney, Director of Public Health at Birmingham City Council. Thanks, James, and, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'll turn on my, my camera briefly just to wave at you, but I am eating my lunch as always while I try and do these things. So we're going to talk through a little bit to begin with uh, about what the webinar series is. Um, and then we're going to uh, talk a little bit about physical activity in general and then a, a special session on social prescribing. So that's the, the format for today. Um, I'm going to just uh, share with me, you some more slides now. So you should hopefully be able to see uh, slides on your screen. There we go. So as I said, the, the focus of today is to give you an introduction to the webinar series. Uh, and James has been working with the team, uh, both within the council as well as partners across the city to bring you a really exciting program of sessions over the, the next uh, few weeks. Um, and in today's session, we're gonna talk about the benefits of physical activity, a bit about the inequalities, uh, and then a bit about uh, social prescribing as well. And I'm afraid I have to leave you uh, halfway through uh, to go and do more COVID stuff, I'm afraid. So first of all, I'd ask you to all go to menti.com. Um, when you go to the website, it'll ask you for the code. So the code you need to put in is 1461658. So that's www.menti.com. And then the code is 1461658. And when you click that in, it will ask you a question. And Menti is a platform we use for getting real-time feedback, um, participation through these kind of webinars. So it's a useful way of doing this. You can also ask questions in the chat box uh, as we go, and the team will be keeping an eye on that because uh, while I'm screen sharing, I can't see the chat box, unfortunately. So the first question we wanted to ask is actually using the chat box, um, which you should be able to uh, see accessing as your chat. Um, Please, can you um, tell us your name and your role? And if you are having technical problems, um, please, uh, you can select uh, Luis.b in the chat. And if you message him, he can help you uh, uh, deal with any of the technical problems. So if you put your name and your role into the, uh, the chat box, and we'll give you the Menti code again in, in a minute. Great, so we can see some physios, we've got some people who work in our wellbeing service, uh, some teachers, um, great selection of people uh, here as well, which is brilliant. The Menti code was um, 1461658. Okay, so, uh, and can you type, type that in the chat box as everyone? Yeah, we'll do as well, yeah. So now if I uh, stop sharing for a second, James will be able to share with you to show you what the results are on the Menti screen. So James, if you can pop up your results, please. Yeah, we'll do. Uh, so come out of that and then I'll just put in the chat box quickly the code and then I'll get the, that's the, that one. Um, and then I'll get the screen up. So the code for anyone that's still looking for it is 1461658. Right, hopefully for sure everyone should be able to see that. Great. So what we can see now is what people have started to put in and, and this creates a kind of word cloud. So the question was, what's your favorite way to get active? Uh, and we can see all sorts of things from gym and running, roller skating, uh, swimming, dancing, walking uh, seems to come out really strongly and cycling as well. Um, if you're still, we've got 21 people have put their words in. So some of you I think are still adding your words. So menti.com, use the code 1461 65 and eight, and just put in your response. Um, and once you've done that, it'll say it's now waiting for the next slide. So uh, keep that web page open because there'll be more questions as we go through 
uh, the session today. But you can already see the word starting to, uh, to grow in the map. And we'll come back to that map later. So if you're still doing it, don't worry, um, we will find it. So James, if you hand back, if you yeah. stop sharing, we'll go stop back share, yeah. to me. This is uh, seamless uh, moving backwards and forwards. There we go. And uh, great. So, um, and we did that because it, it was important to just kind of highlight that actually we all get physically active in very different ways. Um, and if some people are really passionate about swimming or cycling, some people are passionate around walking. Some people don't really think about the ways they get active. It's the way they get to work or the way they get to school. Um, so it can be lots of different things for lots of different people. And that's really important to, to recognize that, that what might work for you as an individual might not work for someone else. So just to go back again to the webinar series. So we created this webinar series to really try and increase the number of people in the community of Birmingham across the city who understand physical activity, its benefits, and to develop your skills to help motivate people to move from inactivity of doing less than 30 minutes of physical activity a week to regular physical activity every day. Um, and that's because we know physical activity is probably the, after stopping smoking, one of the most effective things you can do, which reduces um, your risk of uh, developing diseases like diabetes um, or diseases like cancer. So it's got loads of benefits um, and it's a really important thing we can all do. The seminar series will run over a 10 week period. There are 11 seminars in total. And the focus is really on giving you the evidence base <laughs> about why things are important in different age groups, different disease groups, but also about giving you tips and skills and those little everyday sound bites that you can throw into conversations to help people get more physically active. Also, it will, there are some tips and there are some sessions in here, particularly if you are a provider of physical activity, to give you some tips on how to measure impact and demonstrate impact as well. So there's that, those aspects as well. The uh, program, the topics we've chosen are based on a kind of mix of having sessions which are based on life course. So pregnancy, early childhood, children, uh, young adults, older adults, um, disease conditions like cardiovascular disease, chronic pain. Um, also, how can we help people to be more active in green and blue spaces around the city and really think about those spaces and how they can be used and supported. Um, and then a final kind of wrap up session on the 5th of May. So that's the programme. If there are things as you go through this that you feel um we're missing or we haven't uh covered or you want to find out more about then let us know and um I, and we'll see what we can do to um to close those gaps and potentially add in any additional sessions that might be needed so um moving on to a bit now about why physical activity is important to all of us and why it matters uh, and it really does matter it is the thing that if you could bottle it this would be the wonder drug. Um, what this was supposed to, we were trying to ask you about what you meant by physical activity. And the reason we were, were raising that is a bit like the first question, what kind of physical activity do you enjoy? Lots of people find physical activity in different ways. And um, the important thing is that the, we think about physical activity in the context of uh, aerobic physical activity. So there are things where we're running, walking, cycling, but we also talk about strength and balance activities. So that might be working with weights, doing things like Tai Chi or yoga. And actually we need both types of physical activity to really see benefits. Um, so they're both those aspects. So just moving on to what is the impact of physical activity. There's lots of evidence now about physical activity uh, impact. And, I think you know, probably 10 years ago, we really focused on physical activity being just about sport uh, and just about physical health and, and people try to portray it in the context of losing weight um, or things like that. I think the, the reality is actually, we now know that the evidence base of physical activities, it's much more beneficial uh, for the whole of our bodies in ways we hadn't really known before. And this is because when we're physically active, there are changes that happen in our cells 
at a, down to a cellular level um, that changes basically the chemistry of our body. We release more endorphins so that helps improve our mood. Um, there's evidence that it increases oxygen flow and that increases brain function, um, that increases our muscle strength and our muscle capacity. creates a whole series of, of benefits for the body that ranges from physical through to mental well-being. But there's also evidence that this improves uh, educational attainment, uh, that it reduces social isolation. So there are all sorts of ways in which physical activity can be beneficial, both for an individual and for a community. Um, and what you can see on this slide is that the good evidence is in green. That's where we've got really good, strong studies. There's mixed evidence, which is the orange area. And that's where we have um, some research which says it does show a benefit and quite a lot of research where we don't see a benefit um, or it's not as clear. And that's in areas, for example, like dementia, where the evidence base is not as strong. Um, we have some studies which show that particularly using uh, weights, for example, in frail elderly people can really improve cognitive functioning in uh, very old adults. But they're very small studies and therefore we can't say that's good evidence. So that's why there's some difference in terms of how strongly we believe this is the real benefit of, um, of the activity. One of the things that has changed uh, over the last uh, year or two actually is the World Health Organization did a really good piece of work reviewing the evidence base um, to look at um, when you start to get the benefits from physical activity and really try to, to pin that down a bit more. And what we started to see was from this was that the benefits start really from once you start to achieve more than 30 minutes of moderate physical activity a uh, day. Uh, sorry, a week. And once you get above 150 minutes a week of moderate physical activity, you're really starting to see um, very, very positive benefits across all sorts of dimensions of health and well-being. And some of the benefits around things like cancer risk reduction really become uh, much more significant when you're at the higher end of, say, 300 minutes uh, of physical activity a week. And when we talk about moderate physical activity, we're really talking about things that make you a little bit hot, a little bit sweaty, but you can still hold a conversation. Uh, when we talk about higher intensity physical activity, that's where you wouldn't, you'd be working out so hard, you can't actually hold a decent conversation because you're breathing much more heavily. So moderate, you should still be able to have a conversation, but you are feeling that little bit warm and a little bit shorter of breath. Um, and that's what makes it, that's when it shows that the impact, the positive impact it's having on your body. So in terms of how much you should do, um, the UK guidelines are focused on every, all adults should be achieving 150 minutes of, of moderate activity. And we should be aiming to do that in bouts of 10 minutes or more. Now the World Health Organization updated its guidance last year and it said, well, pretty much any amount counts. So if you're doing it in three minutes bursts, that still counts. It, you know, if you only do nine minutes, that doesn't mean it's a waste of time. Um, and that's a bit of a change. And I think we will see the UK guidance be updated to reflect that moving forward. Now, if you are someone that likes more intense physical activity, you can do it in a more intense way, and that's focusing on uh, 75 minutes. So in effect, you halve the amount of time, but you're doubling the effort, um, and that's to get to vigorous activity. Adults should be undertaking muscle strengthening activity at least twice a week. Um, and I have to say, I always found this one a bit strange. If you could do yoga, you could do exercise with weights, or you could carry heavy shopping. Um, and that's really reflecting actually a lot of muscle strengthening and also balancing activities um, can be integrated into part of everyday life. You don't have to go to a special class um, and simply lugging the shopping back from the supermarket is quite a good muscle strengthening activity and quite a good balancing activity. So it's useful to kind of think a bit about that and how we make it easier for people to integrate physical activity into everyday life rather than it being something that they have to make additional effort for. The other update that happened to the guidance was about encouraging people to minimize the amount of time spent sitting for extended periods. And many of us during COVID have spent far, far too long sitting um, at desks and at computers um, and not walking to work anymore. And those kind of things have really increased um, sitting. 
Um, so it's a balance between moving more, moving with weight uh, and weights and resistance uh, and reducing the amount of time that you sit. So how active are people in England? Well, we know from the Active Lives Survey, which is a, a rolling survey that runs every six months, that about 25%, so just over a quarter of us, uh, are doing less than 30 minutes on average a week of moderate physical activity. And about 62, 63% of us are achieving that 150 minutes or more. And then there's a reasonable group of around 11 to 12% in the middle that are somewhere in the middle. So you can see that still, that's around 36, 37% of the population of adults that are not doing enough physical activity to really see the benefits to their health. So there's still quite a long way to go to improve that. And when we delve down that a little bit more and look at some of the inequalities in this, we can clearly see that actually um, the younger you are, the more active you are, and that activity does decline with age. Um, and some of that is very predictable. As people grow older, they often develop mobility impairments, but that isn't necessarily the reason or the rationale behind it. Some of this is also about isolation, confidence, and the environment in which people live, um, and whether they feel safe and able to go out and walk regularly, for example, um, or use their local leisure facility, and whether they feel it's appropriate or something that's welcoming to them. There are inequalities for other protected characteristics as well. When we look at disability, for example, people living with impairments are less active than people who don't have any impairment. And that's true across all different forms of disability. It's not just about people who have mobility impairments. There's also lower levels of activity in people who are visually and hearing impaired and in people with learning difficulties. When we look at ethnicity, there is a, a difference between different ethnic groups. Interestingly, people who have a mixed uh, racial background and identity are more active uh, than people from, for example, from an Asian uh, ethnic community. So there's some interesting differences between different ethnic groups. Um, and again, that's an important thing to think about. Is that about access? Is it about culture? Um, because we need to address these gaps if we're going to improve fiscal activity across the city. Uh, and improve the health outcomes for everyone that comes from it. If we look from gender uh, as well, in general, men are more active than women. Um, and that's true across most age groups. Um, and also when we look at it in terms of ethnicity, that gap between men and women actually seems to be even more pronounced in some ethnic communities. So if we compare black men and black women, black men are much more physically active than black women. Um, so it's important to think about some of the intersectionalities between these identity groups as well. Um, and on the Active Live Survey website, you can kind of go in and have a real play with the data and look at different demographics as well as geographies if you want to. In terms of faith, there's limited information on faith, but what we can show is that so there are some differences between different faiths in terms of levels of inactivity. And at the moment, the evidence from the Active Life Survey shows that Muslims are more likely to be inactive than Christians or people from a Jewish faith. And other faiths kind of sit in between, but there's often too small a sample to be able to say with confidence these differences are real. The Active Life Survey does collect information on sexual orientation. And what that shows is people who identify with an other sexual orientation are the most inactive compared to people who identify as heterosexual, bisexual, or gay or lesbian. Um, the survey at the moment doesn't ask about gender identity, so we don't know whether that other orientation is reflecting a, a trans identity that's using that to try and be visible, or that is a, a different categorization uh, of sexual orientation. So that's one of the areas where we're still not clear on actually what is this survey telling us and, and what the difference is. When we look at parenthood, um, we see that um, single people are uh, slightly more active than people who are in uh, couples. Um, that may relate to um, them having to do more things. So the more utility-based activity, you can't send your other half to go and do the shopping if you haven't got another half. Um, but the least active group are actually are par uh, alone parents, um, which is interesting. And, and again, that's about how life gets in the way of being physically active. In some ways, life, the things that we have to do every day can make us more physically active. But in other ways, they can make us less physically active because they limit our opportunities 
to get outside of the front door and get physically uh, moving. In terms of pregnancy, there's very limited evidence actually um, in the UK around pregnancy and physical activity. There's some international evidence that suggests that pregnancy in people who are already, really, already relatively inactive um, often become more inactive during pregnancy. But there's really good evidence actually that physically activity during pregnancy can improve outcomes both for mother and baby and prevent conditions like diabetes, gestational diabetes, developing pregnancy. Um, so there's a this real opportunity there to ensure that um, women who are pregnant actually do maintain physical activity. And it's one of the topics we've got in the seminar series to delve down into more detail. So how are we doing in Birmingham? Well, we've looked at adult physical activity. In this session, we're focusing on adults because we've got a, a separate session on children specifically. But in general, we're more inactive. So um, you remember it was about 25% were inactive uh, for England. We're running at 29%. Um, and when we look at the people that are achieving that 150 minutes, it was around 62, 63% for England. And we're running at around 59.5%. So we've got more people that are inactive in the city, similar amount that are fairly active and fewer that are achieving the 150 minutes. So we still got a bit of a way uh, to go in terms of closing the gap. And the problem is we're not getting any more active. And, and then this bar chart, this is looking at the percentage of, of the sample from Birmingham uh, who's in the purple and England's in the red and the West Midlands in the blue. And what you can see is the Birmingham bars pretty much have, have kind of, they went down a little bit in 1718 for a blip and then went back up again. And we've stayed pretty stuck in terms of our levels of inactivity. Um, and that's true across the nation as well. If you look at the England levels, there's been a slight decrease, um, but it's, it's still relatively small. Um, and the West Midlands has rate played pretty static as well. So one of the challenges is we're actually not becoming uh, more active as a nation, we're just kind of stuck, uh, which is really worrying when you look at how much we, how much benefit we could get from physical active, being physically active, if we could move those numbers in a different direction. During COVID, um, obviously we were all staying at home, so less people were doing the amount of physical activity that was recommended. We saw about a 50% decrease in what people reported through our impact survey. Um, and that was a survey of about 4,000 people across Birmingham. Um, the one thing that improved was walking. Um, and there's also national evidence that some people got on their bikes a bit more, but overall the level of physical activity declined. Um, what was positive, however, was the percentage of people who felt easily able to access green space. And that was about three quarters of the people in that survey. So what's interesting is people weren't as physically active, but they did have spaces nearby that they felt they could use um, to be more active. So we're going to move on to the Mentimeter again. So I'm going to stop sharing it and hand back to uh, James uh, to take over. And I'm going to hand back to him to take over for the remainder of this session as afraid I have to go and uh, join a COVID call. So I'll hand over to you to James to take people into the Mentimeter. I hope you really enjoy the session. And I apologise for the interruption that we had uh, from that unfortunate uh, person. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll just share the um, Mentimeter screen. Apologise for the um, the last time we did that. So apologise uh, uh, the issue that we had. Um, so um, just go down to here. Okay. Okay, so some interesting answers there. Um, if, we, um, if we just leave that for a second while we just get some more answers there. Yeah, so quite a few themes there coming out there of sort of central Birmingham really, isn't it? And East Birmingham are coming out of there really. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, so, so that's that. That's interesting. So we'll move on to the next question that sort of leads on from there. Um, which area do you think is the most active?
a few themes coming out of there already. Sutton Coalfield, Arborn area. So this is quite a, quite a diverse area there. It's quite a large sort of spread there, but there's certainly some key themes coming out of that. So I'll get out of that and we'll go back into the presentation a second. Um, <clears throat> Sorry about this, I still... Yeah, so, for, so I guess we'll, we'll have a look at what the actual data shows us here. So, um, uh, I mean, what we've got here is that Actually, Alan Rock, which I believe did come up in the um, in the Mentimeter there, is showing that is the least active area. And as, a as you can see there, I think what's, what this highlights is there's just a significant difference between Bournebrook in different area of Birmingham. And um, I mean, Sutton Coalfield does have quite a, I mean, that did come up as well as, as being a, an active area that, that is uh, significantly more active than Alan Rock as well. So it just shows you the huge amount of difference there just across the city. And obviously, we need to look at ways to see and try and close that gap and, and uh, make all areas of the city um, active. Um, we're going to go back into Mentimeter again to see if we can get some ideas about this question, this important question is about what can we do to reduce inequalities in activity. So I'll just go back into Mentimeter and we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, some really good ideas here. Better communication, um, encouraging participation, positive role models, excellent appropriate imagery. So lots of really good answers here about all really important things that we can do to reduce inequalities here. Um, provide equipment, bikes, lot, lots of really good ideas here. And I think, you know, there, there isn't really one, I mean, following on from this slide, there isn't really a way that we can say that there's a, a you know, there's, there's, I've got the, the answers at the moment. So it is about promoting these ideas and, and thinking about all these different ways that we can do to reduce inequality. But some fantastic ideas there to, to do that. So I'm going to get back into the presentation. There's not a huge amount more of this section left to go. Um, just going to summarize really what we talked about. And um, I mean, Justin uh, quite eloquently sort of laid out some you know, about how the webinars will cover a broad range of areas with a diverse range of speakers, or some absolutely excellent speakers to, to talk about things. Um, the physical activity is for everyone, just uh, highlighting that message really, and that does have significant wide ranging benefits. Um, uh, webinars will try and highlight the inequalities and in activity affecting different groups, and, um, you know, and the potential and potential benefit of, of trying to um, reduce those inequalities. Um, we'll also showcase what is available in Birmingham, some of the newer things as well, but also some of the more existing opportunities as well, um, some fantastic things that, that people are doing. Um, uh, physical activity can help almost everyone, it's just important to say that just every movement counts, doesn't matter what type of physical activity that is, it's just really highlighting that point really. Is there any questions that people have uh, at this time at all? Um, Lewis, I don't know if you can um, highlight any any questions there at all. Uh, I actually think I can access that myself as well. Don't know if anyone's got, I'll just give a little bit of time just for anyone to, to raise any questions there. Don't know if Lewis, you can see any questions at all. I can't see any myself. Um, no, I don't see any questions. No, no, that's great. What I'll do now is I'm going to um, get out, uh, um, get up the presentation that um, we've got um, Joe Robbins to speak to us. Um, we're very lucky to have Joe Robbins today 
to talk about the excellent work that we're doing in social prescribing really. So I'm just gonna uh, share the screen there and we'll um, get that presentation up. Um, James, I don't see Joe on the on the participants list. Um, Lewis, it's because I'm SCTMP. That's right. my Shropshire Council identifier. Right. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I am here. Okay, thank you. Okay, and so just getting up the presentation there in a minute. So, apologise for the delay. And hello, everybody. It's really nice to be part of this uh, webinar, the first one um, that you're doing in a series um, of webinars, which um, in terms of supporting social prescribing, physical activity is absolutely essential um, to that movement, really. So um, I'm going to run through some slides with you about social prescribing, just set the national um, context for social prescribing, and then talk a little bit about the work in the Midlands that's been happening um, over the past uh, two or three years. So I have a joint uh, post, Shropshire Council um, Consultant in Public Health, but um, I do this work for NHS England um, across the Midlands, um, which is obviously a very broad area. So we've got something like 32 clinical commissioning groups and we stretch um, in the Midlands from Derbyshire right across to Lincolnshire over there in the east. Um, Next slide, please. So in terms of social prescribing, um, it's not new. And many of you who have worked in public health or in community or in the voluntary sector will relate to social prescribing because this is about supporting people's well-being and health through a non-clinical um, intervention. Um, whether that be a long-term health condition or whether that be a social issue um, around debt, housing, um, unemployment. But really the whole premise of this is based on giving time to people um, to explore what actually matters to them and then supporting them either to make changes in their lives or to access something which will support um, the issues that they want to make want to change. What is new, um, I would say, is that this is the first time um, prevention has had a really strong element uh, within a long-term NHS strategic plan. And in 2019, um, the funding was announced to support social prescribing and particularly social prescribing link workers. So this is a great opportunity really to enhance and build on all the work that goes on um, across councils, across voluntary sector to support health and well-being um, programs. Next slide, please. So in terms of where this sits within the NHS long-term plan, it's within the personalisation agenda, um, which is all about supporting people with the things that matter most to them, um, whether that be around um, a physical health condition or whether that be around um, something which is supporting potentially complex social needs. Next slide, please. Um, you'll know, many of you, that we don't always need medicine um, and medicine alone often isn't going to be the answer um, for somebody who's feeling lonely or isolated, not able to get out, um, who might be um, under pressure and under stress. Uh, Justin referred to um, physical activity potentially as a medicine. Um, and, and I think I'm a great believer in that as well. Physical activity can enhance people's lives in so many different ways, whether it's their emotional health and well-being or whether it's their physical health. Um, and we don't make enough of that, really, um, I don't think. Next slide, please. So the NHS England, um, alongside the National Network for Social Prescribing, which is a separate entity in its own right, um, have both developed resources which illustrate and demonstrate how to build an effective social uh, prescribing programme. There's plenty of guidance out there now, there are implementation packs um, and those that slide there is illustrative of the kind of things that you need to put in place if you want to build an effective social prescribing programme. I won't go through that in detail now because I'm trying to give you um, an overview. What I will say at the centre of it is a link worker, social prescribing link worker, but a link worker alone um, won't be able to um, achieve what we want to achieve in terms of improving health without some infrastructure support. Um, and that would include physical activity, uh, as well as, of course, lots and lots of other things that people need to improve their well-being and health. Next slide, please. 
So the journey so far, um, since the funding announcement in 2019, um, the ambition is to have 4,500 link workers by 2023 across the country. And there are now hundreds of link workers um, in post. Pre-pandemic, um, many of those link workers were working on a wide range of health and well-being needs. Um, those might be, as I said earlier, health conditions, or they might be issues around unemployment, um, low-level mental health. People come with complex issues often, don't they? And often you can't solve one thing without having to look a little bit more deeply at what those other issues might be. There's a standardised job description uh, for link workers, and there's a whole pack on guidance around implementation. Currently, the roles for link workers have been moved into supporting uh, people who are often shielding um, or who are often within primary care and, and, and are needing some additional support. So the roles shifted, but it will shift back again once we move through the um, pandemic. Every region um, has a dedicated facilitator like myself, uh, regional learning coordinators who are there to support link workers. And now we're developing a number of new roles which are coming out from the National Academy for Social Prescribing. So it's a really, really exciting time in this, in this space. Next slide, please. The differences between link worker and local assets in the community, I think it's quite important to pull this out. Um, because that term social prescribing can is quite broad based, it tends to be interpreted in a number of different ways. But there are clear links between what a social prescribing link worker does, um, who gives time to people, one to one, an hour, ideally, um, and that's what we should be trying to uh, push for continually, to focus on what matters to people. Um, the referral can come from um, GPs, it can come from um, health practitioners working in a GP practice, and we've got many examples of programs where people have self-referred or they've been referred through other forums such as job centres um, or adult social care. They create a simple plan with the person which is based on what's needed by that person and then reconnect them to community groups and agencies or activities or initiatives that are out there in the community. Next slide please. And then, of course, there's multiple assets out there in the community, um, whether that's music clubs, whether it's art clubs, whether it's physical activity, gardening, you know, multiple, multiple opportunities. Of course, at this time, it's quite challenging um, and we can't really have effective social prescribing models without we've, the assets in the community. So it's quite important to emphasise the importance of the value that they bring. And that's a conversation that's happening across the country now in terms of how do we support um, voluntary sector and these kind of community groups to survive, but also to thrive. Next slide, please. So national areas for development. Um, James asked me to talk about what the future holds for social prescribing. So we're going into a new year now um, from April onwards and what will be happening um, through our central NHS England team, but also in each of the regions is uh, supporting the link workers, more around training and supervision, potentially looking at an accreditation program for them um, and supporting their ongoing training needs. So you've got quite, quite a few link workers now across the Midlands area and um, quite a few in the Birmingham area um, through different provider forums and different voluntary sector organisations. And of course, some are employed directly by the primary care networks themselves. We've got supplementary roles coming out um, as well around health coaches and care coordination. This is all part of supporting primary care to develop a stronger workforce in communities. We'll be looking at data collection and the impact of link workers. That's a really crucial part to demonstrate impact. Um, because we need to be able to show others and talk to others about what are the outcomes uh, in terms of link workers working with um, patients and people in communities. And then there'll be a lot about spreading the word about good practice and continuing to raise the profile and the evidence base, which is absolutely um, crucial. I mean, I think Justin illustrated that over many, many years, we've seen the evidence base building and building and building for physical activity. We're at a point where there's quite a lot of evidence now around social prescribing, but we really need to continue to um, evolve that, which is quite exciting, I would say. I kind of liken it almost to 20 or 30 years ago, probably when we had very little evidence around the impact of smoking. And now, of course, we've got lots and lots of it. Um, 
physical activity, we've got lots. With social prescribing, it's still at that evolving, evolving phase. Next slide, please. So we've got also new opportunities, green social prescribing. There are seven sites across the country funded through DEFRA um, to look at the benefits of blue and green um, social prescribing initiatives on people's well-being and health. There are two in the Midlands, um, one in Nottingham and one in Derby. Um, and I'd be encouraging you um, and, and have to James and Justin already about thinking about the work that's happening in Birmingham, because there's a lot already taking place and you might want to be your own green prescription area um, to showcase the work that you're doing. There's work um, happening through the National Academy for Social Prescribing to support thriving communities and NHS charities. Considerable sums of money gone into that to support the voluntary sector. And we're evolving a cultural and arts-based programme with um, sites funded across um, the country, four sites funded through the Arts Council to look at the potential of um, music and the arts on people's wellbeing and health. There's some work going on around digital or about to start around digital infrastructure, which I don't know very much about, but that will roll out um, next year. And excitingly, I think children and young people social prescribing is going to gain more of a profile and there'll be some guidance issued. And we already have a number of small scale pilot programmes across the Midlands, but lots of opportunity to do more in that space, really, um, and particularly potentially with physical activity. Um, we're looking at um, rolling out good practice um, for children and families um, right through from pregnancy to 25 um, plus groups as well. Next slide, please. So the launch um, of the National Academy for Social Prescribing happened about 18 months ago, um, but it's really gaining traction now. Um, and I've put the website on the bottom of this slide so that you can go and have um, a look at that. There's a lot happening. There's going to be more that's happening. And there are lots of new roles that are developing for each region funded by um, bodies such as Natural England, Sport England, Money Advice and the Arts Council, which is all about creating a stronger infrastructure um, for social prescribing um, in each of the regions. Next slide, please. So in the Midlands, um, I won't go through the detail of this slide, but just to say that we've had um, a very proactive and vibrant steering group for social prescribing in the Midlands, um, which has met every quarter. Um, it's chaired by the Director of Public Health, um, who's really committed to social prescribing, um, which is fabulous. And um, we meet every quarter. between 30 and 40 people um, on, those, on those meetings. It's a learning collaborative um, and it's, um, it's made up of organisations and people that want to contribute towards social prescribing because they believe in it and they can see its value. Um, I pick out uh, another one. Um, we've got link workers across the Midlands now and a virtual network of link worker support going across the Midlands um, to discourage isolation and to encourage collaboration between link workers. Um, evidence um, uh, library of impact and good practice that colleagues in Public Health England are pulling together. Because for me, some of this is about promoting the great work that's happening in social prescribing from a Midlands perspective and raising our profile with um, the national team, but also um, across the country. Next slide, please. Um, I won't go through the details um, of those, um, but just to say this is the kind of thing that we're doing constantly is prescribing. Could they develop something? How can they contribute to social prescribing um, in terms of their roles and, and functions, really? And physical activity for us with through the steering group has been a strong element um, of that work over the past year, probably 18 months. We've been lucky enough to have colleagues who have a real interest in sport and physical activity on the steering group. Um, and we've been able to evolve and nurture that work. Um, and so therefore this the work you're doing here fits really, really well with that. Um, last slide, I think, please. This is some of the publication from NHS England. There's rafts and rafts of it now um, in terms of how to set up um, an effective model and um, what the DES contract says for primary care, all sorts of 
um, information there and a collaborative platform where people can go on and access lots and lots of information um, around social prescribing. So I think final, final slide. So yeah. this is our regional team. We're not a team as such in terms of we don't all report into one place. Um, some of us face NHS England and um, the national team, and some of the team face um, National Academy for Social Prescribing. But you can see, you know, it's evolving and we've got a real mix there. So it's quite a busy space now um, in terms of um, the, the roles that are happening around social prescribing. And I think that's probably um, as much as I'd uh, like to say. There are seven um, other areas across the middle, across the country with regional facilitators, very much like myself. Um, sometimes they share that role. We all have limited time. So, you know, a couple of days a week to do this work. So it's really about galvanizing um, enthusiasm and motivation to want to be part of um, social prescribing. Thank you okay. for listening. So thank you very much, Jay. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I just um, uh, just seeing if there's any questions. I, I know Joe's got a small amount of time potentially to answer any questions. Um, uh, I don't know if you can see any in there, um, Lewis, at all. Any questions? Yes, James. There's a question regarding um, details for um, social prescribing. Lewis, can you give me a little bit more information? What, sure. what, yes, what's wanted? Yes. The, um, the question is, where can one look, please? Um, uh, sorry, so, so, so sorry. Um, it says, can you please provide details for a person for a person can apply social prescribing? Where can one look, please forward details? If they um, contact me after today, just drop me an email, depends on where they are, I can potentially direct them to the right service or programme or the person leading that in that particular area. Right. Depends where they are, because obviously, you know, Midlands is quite a, it's quite a big area. So it just depends. OK, thank you. If they, if they drop me an email, that's fine. And I'll, I'll redirect them or help them if I can. Fantastic. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you, Joe. Is there any other questions, Lewis, at all? I don't see any other, no. Great. Um, I've just put an evaluation survey link in the chat box. If, if anyone can complete that, I would really appreciate that. I would just give us some feedback about um, the webinar and, and what you thought about it today. Um, I'd just like to thank Joe again for giving up a time today and, and uh, delivering a very interesting talk. Um, Justin's not here, but I thought Justin's talk was very interesting as well. So and thank you very much for all coming and, and participating in the Mentimeter and really appreciate that. And hopefully we'll see you at some of the other webinars later on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.